Hey everybody, I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on Greek philosophy and Plato's Theotetus, the last talk on Plato we're going to give for this semester, the last of his dialogues. Next will be a talk on Aristotle, then a talk on Aristotle's logic in particular, which will also work for the logic class, as well as some talks on Lewis Carroll I'm going to do in conjunction with. And then we're going to move on to, uh, we have Epicurus, the Stoics and the Skeptics. I believe first the Skeptics, then the uh, then Epicurus, and then the Stoics. And those will be the final talks on Greek philosophy for this semester. But we'll parse those out and we'll see how many talks that is. So the Parmenides, uh, the last dialogue that we did, describes a young Socrates meeting the Eleatics, uh, Parmenides and Zeno, master and student, around 450 BCE. An event that may not very well have happened, um, but is the story Plato tells in order to present us with philosophical ideas. It would have been an amazing meeting if it had ever happened, but no historian records it. So the Theotetus mentions this meeting, uh, then the, and, the, and then, after this, the Sophist and the Statesman, which are dialogues we will not cover in these talks, each refer to the previous dialogue, building on the continuing discussion. Many have noted that the Theotetus displays Plato's later style, which Plato used to attract more philosophy students to his Academy of Athens and Platonic philosophy of the immortality of the rational mind and forms of knowledge. In several dialogues, Plato Socrates argues that if there are eternal forms we can know with our minds, such as the ratios of math and music, then the rational mind is immortal if we can know these things. If we can see something, sense something super sensible with mind but not our senses by using our senses but then through that understanding somehow recollecting in fact according to the Mino not understanding empirically but remembering because we are reminded in an odd way however the physics and psychology works in that out of the fire and the light and the shadows that we can know that the rational mind is immortal. I mentioned uh, with the Parmenides that Hegel liked the Parmenides, and Hegel was aware as a major influence on German and then French thought, a lot of stuff that's still hip and interesting, which is existentialism, postmodernism, post-structuralism, etc., that if you can see a circle, then some part of your mind is immortal. Uh, that if you can see a circle and say, Piaget says sometime around four, five, or six, children learn to say, oh, that just goes on forever. And that shows that the soul is immortal, or the mind, some part of it. Now, I'm not going to argue that, but they say that, and that's part of history. So, Plato is very much saying that here, and then Nicholas of Cusa and Hegel are thus decently Neoplatonists, because they are studying Plato's ideas and then being influenced by them in, an, in new ways, in new eras, uh, with new schools of thought. Technically, Hegel is not in the school of Neoplatonism, but uh, he is highly Neoplatonic. He is a new Plato-like uh, Plato thinker. So, when we withdraw from the senses, this gets a bit Indian or, and or Buddhistic, we can grasp the forms of things with thought, much as we can see someone doing something good, but cannot see the goodness itself, and must think it, or feel it, or mentally have it, talk, feel, be mental, to hold it in mind and compare it to other things. However, this creates a problem. How are particular things we can sense related to the forms of things we can't sense, but can think? Why is the invisible here? Nietzsche definitely, much later, as a post-Hegel German thinker and far less Neoplatonic, he says, what is it with believing in the invisible rather than the visible? Confucius says, he does not say there is no afterlife, but says, well, let's worry about the living people, you know, and we can take care of the invisible others once they and we can see we can take care of the living. So, you don't have to be completely skeptical of anything invisible, certainly, to say, well, what's with the invisible? And Nietzsche's going to say, yeah, Plato was not exactly entirely a materialist. But that is the back and forth of things. And again, I do not think Plato should be viewed as entirely immaterialist, even. And it's hard to say how much, because he doesn't really pin down in text, and perhaps our minds can't divide it. 
He doesn't do all that of a job of splitting something like light and fire from the material and or from forms. But those are debatable points. Parmenides confronts young Socrates with this unsolved problem in Plato's Parmenides, the last text we covered. So in the Theotetus, following the Parmenides, Plato to Socrates argues that we cannot know similarities and differences between sensible mortal things, like horses, particular horses, without knowing the supersensible, immortal forms of things, as if there is a permanent form of the horse, and without a permanent form of the horse, we could not know them. So it does look like Theotetus and Socrates are struggling with what was done in the Parmenides before, so as stated, some say that is incomplete, because it definitely seems to lean Parmenides, but now is Plato even evolving? Is he putting his feet down firmly again in the totem pole, showing us he's rising above this? I did clip a uh, piece of the School of Athens for the cover of the last video, and you can note Parmenides is not actually uh, at the top. Pythagoras is above both dueling uh, Parmenides Heraclitus, which makes the sense, and clearly is Raphael, not the Ninja Turtle, again, uh, I don't even think he was Italian, is that, yeah, that you find uh, Pythagoras is sort of, well, math is real, but it's also unreal. And here you have the super sensible and the sensible together. When you see five oranges, where is the five? You know, these are Indian and Greek and Chinese problems that are interesting. A lot of that is philosophy, and many would say it useless. I don't. I have more to say, of course. You know, as Lewis Carroll says, I pluck button, I pluck <laughs> butterflies from the sky and sell them as mutton pies in the street. That is how I make my wares. You know, or those are my wares and that's how I make my living, as it were, and wear. You know, quite the werewolf. So, you have here um, that in the sophist, he then says that we can argue we know similarities and differences between the forms themselves. So the questions about the relations between the sensible things that boy Socrates cannot answer in the Parmenides are answered in the Theotetus, and then the questions about the relations between the forms themselves are answered in the Sophist. Parmenides did say you will become unstoppable. He didn't say to him, though. Where Socrates also contrasts the Sophists, such as Gorgias and Prote Protagoras, with genuine seekers of knowledge beyond the Heraclitean flux of the sensibles in the world of shadows below, the desirable things as opposed to forms of good, which then we can follow in spite of the passing things, or with and in spite of. In Plato's dialogue, the Theotetus, shortly after Socrates' death, Eucleides uh, and Terpsian, Terpmaster Terpsian, friends of Socrates who were at his side in Plato's Crito, mourn that Theotetus. So they're going to, they're gonna later be with Socrates when he dies. So again, the audience knows sort of what's going to happen, and these are some of the people. They are mourning after Socrates is dead in the beginning here. We're going to flash back in the thing. That Theotetus, a courageous warrior and later a noble student of, mathematic of mathemat <laughs> mathematics in Plato's Academy and the mathematicians there, is suffering from dysentery and near death. Eucleides says the Eucleides says that Socrates met young Theotetus before Socrates' death, conversed with him as a boy, so we had boy Socrates, Parmenides couldn't best him. Now we're gonna have boy Theotetus, adult Socrates, who bests who, and Socrates constantly says, Well, which of us is greater, do you think? So it's a parallel it's one another step clearly paralleling a parallel and mirroring of the last text of Plato's last dialogue, the Parmenides. So, Eucleides says, Socrates met young the Hey, buddy, I gotta be doing this. Mortal being, yes, and desire. That Socrates conversed with him and saw through prophetic insight, which these guys seem to think that uh, ideas and theophanies and theories are godlike visions we kind of that kind of drift into their heads like the Roman genius and higher spirit of the mind, somewhat inside and outside of us. That he received a prophetic insight that Theotetus would become the remarkable man that he is. Terpsian asks if you uh, Eucleides can repeat the conversation. And Eucleides says he can't recite it from memory, but he took notes that he and Terpsian should listen to his slave boy read it to them at his place. So not so much over the slavery since the Mino. 
Thus we have a play within a play. So in the central dialogue, Socrates asks Theodorus, a mathematician known for lectures about geometry, if the young people from his hometown devote themselves to geometry and knowledge. Theodorus says yes, that he knows one boy who is brilliant, and that he would hesitate to speak if the boy was beautiful. This again, um, throughout all of this, there's going to be a lot of homoerotic undertones. And again, this is not technically marked for children, but we're not going to get very graphic. All I'm going to say here, I have indulged in making constant puns and somewhat questionable jokes throughout this kind of material. I will probably not be able to help myself because I like to go on tangents. Let us just say here, such that I don't have to say this multiple times and make you and I and everyone uncomfortable forever, is that there is very clearly here subtext where... There could be something sexual going on here, which is the symposium. Watch the symposium talk, and then listen to this. It is very clear where Socrates does not intend to present himself as a sexual person, but that he is almost entirely presenting himself as a sexual person, at least in metaphor, because metaphorically he is going to be making a lot of plays on, well, there could be romance here, but it isn't because it's knowledge which is like romance and love. Now again, platonic folks in the Renaissance, the Neoplatonists, who brought it to a bunch of other folks in Western Europe, they said, and though that's the inspiration for the School of Athens and all the statues, etc., and the art that's Platonic and displaying Plato and Aristotle, that they said there's nothing going on here, and oh, it's purely Platonic, which is where our word Platonic comes from. Oh, no, it's not sexual at all. Well, yes, in fact, that's in the dialogue. Socrates is like, wow, this isn't sexual at all. But yeah, that's there's double meanings, and there's the hidden and the revealed, as the Taoists like to talk about here, which we already have with the manifest and the hidden, the material, and the mental and the meaning, and the higher and the invisible, and the super sensible. So we already have that. And here saying mental is a sort of a, you know, more our body by... I, <laughs> my words again, intertwine appropriately. Our body-mind kind of distinction is again not only somewhat uh, mistaken, but then it's not necessarily how they're thinking. But there is something like the invisible and the emotional and the spiritual, which is not just in the head, but upward and invisible. And so they are talking about emotions and ideas as the super sensible and that that is truly the permanent, the eternal, and that is the forms of horses and where horses come from, along with math and meaning, and that is what is important. And that is what is real, as opposed to the shadows, which is the material. That is all going to be cast in a whole lot of sexual metaphors, and, unfor and I'm just going to say, yeah, watch the plays on that, and I may just, you know, look at you funny here through the camera, but I'm not going to say much other than look at you funny because I don't want to keep repeating myself. And I already gave a little spiel about, what, uh, about homosexuality in the time of the Greeks and cultures and stuff. And you can look at that and also look up more about it because I am not the expert, thankfully, on all of this. But I have to know about it a little because, heck, it is in this text something fierce, as we'll see. So Theodorus, not Socrates, says, well, he's a pretty looking boy. And he says, I could be accused of being in love with him and infatuated with him, but the boy, uh, but the boy is rather ugly. Much like Socrates himself, but not as ugly. So we're having here some comedy. As Theodorus is somewhat embarrassed, but not too embarrassed to say. He keeps saying, well, I don't want to say, you know, I mean like you, not like you. I mean ugly, but not like you, you know, and it's Plato being a comedian again. He tells Socrates that the boy is unlike anyone he has ever met before which presumably includes Socrates himself. Here we have, he's amazing more than anyone, and we kind of have a bit of love in spite of the ugly, like the symposium. With a quick wit, the boy has, and a gentle spirit, a good mind, and a good heart. Spirit, mind, heart, that would be, again, you have something like mind, spirit, breath, heart, um, etc., stomach, that he is at least going over major organs and, and virtues. Generally, those with great minds have untamed hearts. This very much plays on the this versus the this, which is the super sensible, grasped up here, like with the eyes seeing light and fire, but that super sensible material, mud and hair is lowly material. Again, it's not exactly the dualistic, but it is decently, and there's something super, super sensible. That the boy is unlike anyone he has met, he has, generally, those with great minds have untamed hearts and are quick to love and hate, but unsteady and undetermined, while those with strong, confident hearts are even keeled, but often dull and stupid. This boy, however, is smooth like a stream of olive oil, brilliant but smooth, quiet 
and steady with insight. He sounds like the quiet storm, you know, on the local radio station. It's, uh, and yeah, there's a metaphor for you. It's uh, refer to your lover, you know, as a, like a stream of olive oil and see how they respond. Perhaps like oil, perhaps not, you know, uh, perhaps a bit more spiky than that or prickly. So essentially, um, while not advising you in anything like this situation here, you have here a really interesting idea, which I do, I am going to bring up with Edgar Allan Poe. I'm going to do some videos soon for the logic class ahead of the game on work on Edgar Allan Poe and Lewis Carroll that I really like. But Lewis Carroll and Edgar Allan Poe are both logician, mathematic-minded people who really like emotion and meaning. And both of them say a lot of really interesting things, Poe in his detective fiction, and then Carroll in his Wonderland, and I will do more videos about all of that. But I will just say here without pausing that Poe actually says something remarkably similar with his Dupont character who is the proto-Sherlock Holmes, the character who somewhat, not entirely, but plenty inspired Sherlock Holmes, who's a very different character, but somewhat similar. Because Sherlock Holmes is often presented as not being able to understand others' emotions uh, and is sort of factual rather than emotive. But Poe's Dupont, the original, uh, detective in some of the original, the, some of the, uh, many say the first English detective stories, some say the first detective stories, he says something very similar to this, and Poe is versed in the classics as well as in French and in good, uh, much, uh, he tries to have a background in human thought as much as he can, and an eclectic one as I do. And he sounds a bit like Plato or other systems of thought when he says, like Kundalini and like uh, the Republic, some people are stacked really well up here, but they don't have a good heart stacked in a row here. And some people are stacked up good in their heart, but they don't have it well in their head. And he says, when you have a big head, you kind of are tipping over like this and you don't have a good heart because you're really brainy. Here, this actually allows oddly for philosopher kings to possibly be corrupt and terrible as brainy people. But Plato, I think, would hope that the testing wouldn't allow him to get that far, because first they'd have to be gymnastic people, somewhat based, and then they would have to be somewhat higher based, as once you have the firm kind of... Uh, Plato does say that somewhat in the Republic, is that you first have to be physically good, although, again, we have ugly people and Socrates and other stuff. It's not entirely consistent, but it does seem like you somewhat have to have physically good people, and then they also can be mental. And that's what he is saying here. You need to be both. This is also Pericles. We have not compromised our manliness, even though we have looked, learned book learning like the East. I say all the time, it's one of the only written records we have of Athens, apparently, is in that speech of Pericles. You have here, you need a balance of body and mind. And here he is saying, this boy seems to have both a good heart, not a physical gymnastic body, and he's somewhat ugly, unfortunately. He's dissing the kid. But... This kid has a good heart, so he's based, and he's solid, and he's on firm footing, and then he also has a good mind. Uh, Poe says that city people, he says in the 1800s, which certainly still applies today and all over the world, city people, he says, are really, really brainy, but they have chicken hearts, and they just sort of, and he's talking about the cops. Really, this is the first detective to say, I know, I can beat the cops at their own game easy. These guys are fools. But he doesn't say because they're superstitious. Poe says because cops are these science types who just apply spreadsheets and they don't feel. See, I feel and I'm an empath and I'm a psychic, basically, which Poe actually, like Conan Doyle, thought that you open yourself up and feel the spirits and the energy. Was decently Neoplatonic also like that, sort of more like 1800s ectoplasm long before Ghostbusters spiritualism. So he actually says, and I'm going to do more videos about this, I am pausing here. You don't just have a good top level and then you're terrible below. You need to be based and up then high grown. And he says, no, some people are really solid, good warrior people. They're just dull, you know, and they're, they're a bit dim in the head, but they're solid people. And you don't really want to have people who are brainy, who are not, who don't have solid hearts, who are not even keeled emotionally. And I'll leave that right there, because actually that's where, you know, Poe's work departs decently from this, kind of wildly, in fact, because Poe's a bit Dionysian and kind of crazy, um, and not so platonic in many ways, uh, a bit Diogenes, a bunch, you know, and think of Poe's stories and the telltale heart and all of that. So we're going to get into Poe and do some of that, because I do think Poe is definitely thinking of Plato and other things. So the telltale heart in things would be something symbolic. He probably is thinking of things. There's over-interpretation. But... Poe and Carol both. And it is good to think, if we're brainy people, but if we can't feel for others, 
I will not speak at length right here, but I do think a lot about this kind of thing lately, is that uh, having a good heart is possibly, you know, more, even more basic than having a very uh, fast and witty and well-educated mind, which is what many, many, many have said. In fact, existentialism, which comes after Poe and after Nietzsche, Poe comes before Nietzsche, actually, uh, is writing a lot in the 1830s and 40s before Nietzsche, is writing his work in the I believe uh, a lot of his major work in the 60s, 70s, 1860s, 70s, and 80s is that basically you need a solid heart and we don't have a solid heart in modern times. I was watching existential films that make you want to cry and again, that is existentialism 101. We may have great hearts, great science, great power. That's the killing of the sacred deer movie all over. But if you don't have a good heart, if uh, you know, then, well, good luck, you know, because that's kind of hell. So anyway, this guy is saying here that he has a good heart and he has a good head. Theodorus sees the boy, young Theotetus, coming towards them with his friends and helpfully tells Socrates that the boys have been oiling themselves up outside. He actually says this after saying he's like a he's stream of olive oil smooth and seem ready to do whatever it was that they were oiling themselves up for. Perhaps, let's hope, wrestling. Theodorus asks Theotetus to sit with Socrates and talk to him. I am always thinking here, would you sit down, you know, and uh, you thought you were communicating with oiled up 13-year-olds, didn't you? You know, would you sit right there? Uh, you know, well, we just need to have a talk for a little while. You know, I am doing the to catch a Socrates. And uh, to, to catch a, th which hopefully we're not doing to catch a Theotetus. Socrates tells Theotetus he wants to test him to see if he indeed has a character like that of himself. Self. He actually says, I want to see if you're like me. Socrates is definitely dropping a little bit. He is uh, sometimes being falsely modest and then being like, yeah, and I'm a jerk, aren't I? He definitely comes off like that several times here to the boy, like he is daring the boy. He is being a jerk in front of the boy to see if the boy will be a jerk back to him, but the boy continues to be consistent and good. And that seems to be part of it, as if da uh, Socrates is a bit the Taoist trickster, uh, trying to specifically be a moral like, come on, come on, no, that, and he, that's solid. So Socrates uh, says, I want to see if you're as good as me, which again is not the modesty, you know, and, but he does sound kind of like that in his trial at people. Theodora says, none were better than this kid, just as the oracle said of Socrates. So we're having, a, this is actually what this is doing, kind of like a Zen koan. This is showing to us that Socrates is going to live in the form of the boy. Now we flash back, what's happening? The boy's going to die which means Socrates died, the boy's going to die. That's kind of okay because the super sensible is lasting beyond the sensible, the bodies. We're seeing that demonstrated by this boy being the next Socrates. And then he's dying, but that's okay. We actually now can see all that here because it's like, oh, wait, if you're thinking ahead of the game, it's like, but the boy's going to die, but, see, but Socrates already died and the boy's going to die, but that's okay because we're still alive and the boy died, but hey, we're here and we can keep being the immaterial and the good and all of that in the flesh, but super sensible. All of that is laid out quite well here already. We have all that in spite of, yeah, you don't even have to know anything yet that's going to happen. And all of that we already know is going to happen quite circularly as in circle and circle and circle, you know. So... Theodorus says none were better than this guy, and this is supposed to be happening just before Socrates' trial, where he tells everyone he has to question everyone, and the oral oracle asked him to do so to see if he is wisest, and so he can play the fool. Why? Because I'm, he's doing the work of the god. It's not about him. Socrates begins by stating, and Theotetus agrees in Yes Man's style, like in Book 2 and Following of the Republic, that if they each had a harp, what the Greeks call a lyre, what the Cretans confusingly say of themselves, if Socrates played a note and Theotetus played the same note, if Theodorus was just anybody, they would not trust him to judge that they are tuned to the same pitch. But if Theodorus was a musician with expertise and experience, they would both trust his judgment. Socrates has been compared to Theotetus indirectly, judged to be similar by Theodorus, and Socrates says that Theodorus is an expert in intellectual matters. He's a mathematician, which means he knows something about the form of the good, which is apparently Pythagorean and mathematical, because why else were we listening a bunch to Timaeus? So Socrates should trust his judgment and examine Theotetus, whom Theodorus has praised above everyone. Socrates says, so, hey, they love this kid. He's like me. I got to make sure I got to see how uh, I got to see how much he can take and how he can be tested. Now, Socrates says there is one small matter, just one little thing. One, you know, ma'am, sir, I got one more question. You know, Columbo, if you parked your car, you know, I got one small question. It's just been bugging me. I just I, I don't know. 
Columbo is definitely a simple country lawyer, Dupont character who's duping people for an American audience who can't pronounce French. Um, and this is definitely Socrates duping people. And there's many videos to make in the future about, again, not only Poe, but Columbo. And again, because that is also a simple country lawyer, Taoist sage trickster who is smart and who is figuring you out by acting the fool. I have a good video about Taoists and acting the fool, if you like. Don't say much about Socrates there. I hope I mention him once or twice. So there's just one small thing. You know, I just got one question and just the facts, ma'am, uh, which Theotetus and the others can help him think out. Learning something makes us wiser. But does this mean that knowledge and wisdom are the same thing? That gathering knowledge and understandings is the same thing as reason and insight? Now, that's a good question. Knowledge and wisdom, as Yoda says, uh, I think in the first of the prequels. In the context of Plato's dialogues, we can ask, does taking positions and counterpositions and arguments with everyone teach us anything or help us to think, as well as storing up knowledge? So in their day, though, I mean, we might say, does being encyclopedic book learning, remember in their day, it would also be more open investigation and they didn't know as much. It is open investigation, but we have large, vast systems we can just trust. Large world religions full of vast bookcases of books and medicines and recipes for things that do and don't work, I imagine, all over the place. Uh, that, given all of that, does all that make us good? But again, it's like we have much uh, all the systems, but also the ability to go back and forth with things, because all of that is somewhat know-how and then wisdom acquired. So Heraclitus says yes, but wisdom is beyond all human knowledge and positions, while Parmenides says no, because knowledge is essentially something ultimately like an illusion, and wisdom is silent without division, doesn't move, is the oneness of all, or at least at least contradicts itself with complete and cosmic consistency. Both would agree wisdom is not simply words and human understandings attached to them, but Theotetus says yes, they are the same thing. Now, that is going to be a problem, because Theotetus is technically here going to be wrong. Um, and Socrates sort of already has that. It isn't that he's completely wrong. In some senses, now this is classic dialectic. Sameness and difference, back and forth, yes and no, doubt and belief. So, yeah, but also belief, but also no, and the doubt. So they are and are not the same thing. And Socrates has done that already many times. So if he says knowledge and wisdom, yes, the same thing. I learn a lot of science. I learn a lot of religion. Now I'm a very wise person. Now, again, I just said, yeah, that's a little more modern of a view in with our historical hindsight. But of course, these guys also had history and hindsight. So, if he says yes, the technician or the specialist, which, if you think about it, Socrates has actually already asked us, hilariously, to trust the wisdom of Theodorus because he's a mathematician. So this is a bit of a backstop to the Republic and the math mathematics and music study just levies you upward, isn't it? Socrates says he's puzzled. Okay, you think knowledge and wisdom are the first thing, as they will have to understand knowledge first. Well, that's going to be easy. It will only take several thousand years more. First, before determining if it is identical with wisdom. And if wisdom has anything to do with open-mindedness, uh, which is part of the play I want to bring up here to show, wisdom is often identified as open-minded, open-thinking, where you can see further perspective and things. It's not necessarily that, and I definitely don't want to present wisdom as openness as opposed to closure, because it could be wise to defend something or to protect. But because knowledge is more of a fixed form and wisdom is often something where it's thought and speculation, like philosophy to science or religious practice, which you find the world over a lot, and you do find, and human beings would translate words like wisdom from other cultures looking for something like what the Greeks are referring to in order to, for us, and to understand them and others. With words like wisdom, psychologists uh, are actually studying words like wisdom a bit now with people, even though that's a bit of a loose concept as opposed to knowledge, because wisdom is kind of open-minded thinking a bit. Not just openness, though, because how open should you be? The basically, Theodorus is an expert on mathematics, so he ought to know um, if Socrates and Theotetus have similarly tuned mind and minds and hearts. So he's the best guy, but actually we also have, but who can he say is the play also. This is a good, uh, good drama. Good writing on Plato's part. Socrates tells everyone they will each take turns speaking, of course, as boys take turns in a ball game, and if they miss, they have to sit out. But if a boy does not miss, he gets to be king and ask any questions he likes of the others. 
Well, this is basically setting this up, of course, like in Buddhist texts and in like other religious and philosophical texts, that are, that not only are you able to, in complex ways, uh, get the right answers out of the slave boy once you lead him in the right way, but you're also going to be able to stand up to questions and then be freely questioned by the youth. So, of course, who's going to win of the kids and who's going to get to ask questions of whom, you know? Yeah. We already see it coming. Um, and that means that Socrates is testing and himself lining up to be tested with questions. And ultimately, Plato does say here, well, next time, well, next time, well, next time. And he does the following dialogues. And then eventually, well, I'm seeing a man about a horse at a trial. And Plato may have wanted to direct everyone over to the Academy Tree Grove area to hang out with him and talk grad school. It's not very clear. Um, but... That is the part where Plato may know more, may know, may have wandered in his thinking, may have had answers that add this totem pole up a bit more. Again, remember, uh, as always mentioned, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, largest systems of thought in human history. Platonism is a decent enough structure for not essential to necessarily all types of Christianity or Islam at all. But Platonism was a major structure of and conveyed by Christianity, Islam, and the Abrahamic religion. So that's a very big part of Eurasia, Africa, and then the Americas. It has a, this stuff has a very interconnected history with a lot of things. It doesn't have to be entirely true, but like Buddhism, and I do have, well, I am proud that I know a decent amount about Buddhism, a decent amount about Neoplatonism, even though both tell me not to be proud. You know, Heraclitus more Buddha than Plato says pride is the human disease. But if Buddhism is like Platonism at all, that suggests something about what sort of large systems people believe in, whether or not they're true or they're controlling or they're freedom or what have you. So again, um, these motions, and when I do point out again, it's like it's like Buddhist texts, they're setting it up to be questioned. It's, I am trying to find, again, the general larger thousands and thousands of years human cultures and sorts of moves we make. At least try to point them out and then leave that open for your wisdom and questioning and understanding. Hopefully your understanding and patience. So at Socrates' trial, which happens just after this and the next and then the next dialogue, which seemed to happen very soon in sequence, he is specifically accused of corrupting the youth, whether or not the youth are pre-oiled. Again, let's hope for wrestling. This, uh, again, is a very questionable text and it's central to plenty of civilization. Socrates says that if we want to know what clay is, we can't say that clay is made into pots by the potter, and bricks by the brickmaker, and ovens by the oven master. Because, if we want to know what clay is, we can't just say, well, it's this and that and that. Now that, of course, is, well, we can't say what form is if we're just like, well, it's form of this, form of that, form of that, is another level above. Similarly, we can't say what knowledge is and understand it. By saying there is the shoemaker knowing how to make shoes, the furniture maker making furniture, and the doll maker making dolls. This is a bit anti-Gorgias. But rather, what is the common stuff of it? Remember, uh, Socrates tells Mino, the guy is, he was teaching you is a jerk. It's common to all. Socrates says that clay is earth mixed with water, basic elements that are solid and fluid, not whose clay it is or what is it, what it is used for. Now notice there's a very subtle thing going on that can shoot right by you. We are talking about the material and the eternal, you know, and the super sensible and clay earth mixed with water is one element mixed with another is solid mixed with fluid. Now you might be tempted to say that earth here would stand for the material, the visible and maybe water, which is rather see-through. I guess it's a wine dark sea um, for Homer, but in spite of that, that you have here the, that it is, it does seem, rather than say that, that actually this is very much kind of like uh, Jesus gives the whole house built on sand parable. You could take the earth as the impermanent and the clay and the sand. These metaphors can flip all back and forth and, we can, and anybody can use them rather artfully uh, in ancient Greece, China, or anywhere. And it is basic human intelligence and wit and wisdom to take forms of knowledge and flip them around and use them any way you want. It displays that open-ended speculation and wisdom with the fixed forms. And that one is fluid with them. But 
it definitely seems here that the fixed clay is oddly enough when it's water mixed with clay and earth, earth mixed with water, he seems to be actually suggesting, even though the earth is quite opaque, that you have the solid, which is the eternal, which ironically is the super sensible. And again, Nietzsche's like, so what solid are we talking to here if we believe in the acquire invisible again? But then again, Nietzsche's more the cynical, uh, cynical anti-Platonist, one could certainly say. Not necessarily the materialist, more like a romantic who doesn't like fixed forms entirely, writes angry books to the editor. But Socrates says that basically the fluid and the temporary, which is water, is then mixed up with the more solid, which is something like permanence and mind. We have covered Buddhism and Jainism uh, this semester. There's a lot on Indian philosophy about mud and mixing water and earth and lots of metaphors for being and non-being. And what you can see here is that not only is permanent being something like the material and the substantiated like this hand, but at the same time, what Plato is actually saying is, as well, Plato is rather the Platonist, isn't he? Although exactly how? It's still debated. He follows himself often, you know, but not entirely. Is that it looks like the earth is the invisible and the forms that are invisible above the horses and us and the uh, down here fluid and shadows in the cave seems to be what he is saying. The water is the shadows and the earth here is oddly enough the light and the fixed and the permanence, like the tip of the pyramid, fixed up rooted in the heavens as Timaeus says we are as plants rooted in, in our heads in the heavens and ideas. Theotetus says this is remarkably like a point he made to Theodorus as he was teaching them geometry the other day. When he and the other boys realized that they could group numbers into square numbers and rectangular numbers. Math here is not so algebraic, it is very geometric. We are so used to algebra, I do like to point out here and with Pythagoras, that we don't even think of squares when we square things anymore. We take a leap, which is fine, because in a certain sense, geometry is itself a leap of generals that would then gather, similarly, particulars, uh, sensibles. But they actually sensed the forms of math where they drew them out into triangles and squares a lot more where we use algebra today and skip all of that because it is incredibly convenient to automate all that with the symbols of algebra, one could say. In fact, it's not really automating, it's just sidestepping entirely. And here I'll let other discussions be for some other time. So just as numbers can be divided into squares and rectangles, and here he says uh, four is a square, but three and five are rectangles because you can't make them into a square. Anything not a square is a rectangle. It makes basic mathematical sense, but it would geometrically, not algebraically, which is fascinating to think about. And how we do that. It's much like having a device of some kind, but not entirely, because math is very much also in your head, especially like a language or communication. And you're doing it without mechanical parts to do algebra in your head or talk it back and forth with others. And the algebra is invisible beyond the symbols and the things in the apricots. So just as numbers can be divided into squares and rectangles, just as clay can be divided into earth and water, solid and liquid, but Theotetus says he cannot answer the question of knowledge by similarly dividing it into two parts. And so perhaps he cannot divide knowledge into the fixed and the unfixed parts of knowledge. If you talk paradigm shifts and scientific theory and debate philosophy of science today, you might find yourself in a similar bind. The reason would be because human beings have, it's a rather Hegelian answer, been rather dogmatic and skeptical, rather solid and rather fluid the whole time, which Hegel thinks gets us into politics and everything else. With the French, you know, and everybody and everybody otherwise. So perhaps Theodorus was wrong to say that he was as wise as Socrates. Socrates says that if Theotetus beat him in a race, they could say he was faster, but neither of them have bested the other, as neither know what knowledge is, at least yet. So Socrates is saying, no, I haven't figured it out yet. I'm working my way towards it. So he is somewhat the Mino slave, but he's trying to tarry towards the good and doesn't have the form of it yet. He's going to work it out with this kid, which almost suggests the further Socrates are going to get us further and further, which may be Plato somewhat selling himself uh, and his school and his successors a bit. 
Neither know what knowledge is yet, and he proceeds as he did with the slave boy. Also, he has several dialogues to talk this out, so he doesn't want to conclude it completely here. Um, as he did with Namino, he leads Theotetus and himself to an answer together. Now, is he feigning ignorance or not? We are still, we are, we have to be totally in the dark here. Maybe he's being, a, I don't know. Yes, I'm a simple country lawyer. Which I've said too often while talking of Socrates. Theotetus says he has never heard anyone answer the question of what knowledge is, but he has often thought about it, and he can only tell Socrates about how he feels. They're the intuitionism and the diatema, teaching Socrates about love. Socrates says that his mother here he segs into, which again speaks diatema. His mother was the, sorry to say, full-chested midwife, Freinariti. Uh, Freinariti. Uh, Yes, I uh, don't know what topping that is. But yes, uh, I'm going to default to I am a terrible language person. Phrenarity, I'm going to say. The mom of Socrates, Socratic mom. And that he is also a midwife, he himself. I was telling a student the other day, Socrates keeps saying he's a midwife. And she was like, I'm a midwife. You know, it's like, that is awesome and needed. An el and probably dangerous nowadays, an elder who has passed childbearing years, who helps others conceive children. But unlike most midwives any of us would consider tiring, he tests children to see which of them are real children and which of them are mere ghosts. Socrates says the heavens, the gods, forbid him to have his own ideas, but rather to lead others into having them. Again, is he tricking us? Does he already have the ideas? And he's like, I don't know anything. I just lead others. Yeah, that's what I do. Maybe that's hidden and revealed both. Soon after this, Socrates will be accused of atheism at his trial and believing in both no gods and new gods. What are you talking about? Theotetus is pregnant with a possible idea, Socrates says. Here again, you have very unfortunate puns. I will pass over again without speaking. And Socrates is going to help him conceive and then test because as a midwife, Socrates can tell that this oiled up boy again is uh, with child. So Socrates, so knock it off. Also, Socrates says he works with men who have ideas, not with women who make babies. Again, this is marvelous egalitarian hour here, you know, on uh, on the channel. And that men having ideas suffer distress far greater than women making babies. He says this. Now, funny, yeah, clearly Socrates' midwife mother taught him much. I will say right here, this is probably a bit of a joke. Now, while also I think it's possible to certainly agree with many a feminist and say the Greeks were a tad bit patriarchal. So when Socrates here effectively, I have to say like modern people on the internet, say that boy, you know, men know how to how suffering feels because their Minecraft dog died, you know, and then say, and I've seen actual jokes on Reddit. Yeah, therefore, I understand how painful pregnancy can be. You know, my video game character has to respawn, you know, which is hopefully a joke and not pure some court of, well, it's more narcissism than, soci you know, than being a sociopath, and it's seeking attention inappropriately. Like jokes, you know, and like most of what I tell you. So, here he basically could be getting a rise out of the audience. Probably, may, it could be an exclusively male audience, you know, and women aren't allowed in there. Um, I am, I'm, it could very well be that, and... He's going to get a chuckle out of the dudes, you know, it's like, and then the wife told me, you know, and then haha, -ha, you know, and so he's like, clearly men, when their ideas are broken, you know what I mean? And they're, and they have great plans and then men's plans are dashed, their mental ideas, because women are like body hissy fit people who just like blubber all day with emotion, you know, although that is, would be part of the mental and the uh, immaterial, you know, other than the tears is that women just make babies, and so when men have ideas, their ideas are crushed, they far, they, you know, they suffer far greater pain than women do in childbirth. This is either a really great joke, or Plato being one of the lesser sensitive, possibly uh, more immaterial and unmanifest, you know, uh, interesting playwrights that certainly we've had of several centuries. But yes, um... Plato, unlike Poe, is not so trying to play the female heart, mind, and all of that, uh, as the Taoists would suggest. Poe is. He's trying to set you up uh, being into young women's emotions. But Plato, not so much. So, But he is being bawdy here with Socrates. If, he says, Theotetus had a, has a miscarriage, Socrates will throw out the child idea. He does sort of, it's like, oh, but unlike any midwife you'd hire, I would dash the kid against the fireplace to make sure they're tough enough. You know what I mean? It's like, get that guy out the door. Don't let him anywhere near either your children or your ideas. Again, children have 
As in the Parmenides, uh, children have ideas, uh, people have children with their bodies and ideas with their minds because they want to live forever. One of the best lines of Plato I do like from the Parmenides we had last time. So he says Socrates will throw out the idea if it's bad, but he asks that Theotetus not act like a woman who just lost her firstborn when he does it. Don't just freak out on me all unnecessarily when your child dies. You know what I mean? That would just be too much. Be a man, you know, about it and have no emotion when your kid dies. Socrates often destroys the initial ideas of his debate partners as he did in the symposium all around. I do also suggest he's making jokes constantly. He might be very old school, uh, old, old academy, but he may very well know that possibly his own male audience finds that hilarious thing, a hilarious thing to tell their wife later, you know what I mean? And then get a face full of an urn full of, you know, uh, something to throw out, you know, or something. I don't know. A bit Dionysian. I wasn't there again at the time. So Socrates asked Theotetus to take a shot at defining knowledge, possibly to shoot him down. Theotetus starts where Hegel did thousands of years later in Germany with sense certainty. And Hegel is doing that knowing his Plato and knowing his stuff. So I have this cup. Yes, and sipping of the coffee. So if I have this cup and if I sip the coffee... Then we can start with saying, okay, I know something, I know this hand, I know things, things are things. So knowledge is perception and observation. The American expression, right is rain, sums it up. Uh, an American uh, judge once said famously of obscenity and pornography, I know it when I see it. And it's like, I can't define it, but just, you know, point me in the direction of a zebra and I, uh, yep, there it is. You know, and even if I don't know much about zebras at all, I can see it. Uh, Socrates says... That this is what Protagoras meant when he said man is the measure of all things. A zebra is whatever a zebra is to us. And then if we change what a zebra is, or we start saying it differently, then zebra is not that anymore to us, is it? That's what Socrates is saying, and he's going to say that's not good enough forever, all of this. And again, and measure is, man is the measure of all things, possibly including midwives and childbirth and child pains. Growing pains? If the wind makes one man cold and another man not cold, then the wind is perceived to be, appears to be, and Protagoras is both cold and not cold, known in two divergent ways. The skeptics we will have soon will say, if you come out of a bathhouse, you're cold. You weren't before because relativity. It's a good example, and people have bathhouses. Socrates wonders if Protagoras was secretly ingenious and throws out his obscure saying, maybe he's just lying to us because he's brilliant, it's a noble lie, to benefit the common herd like themselves, and kept the truth as a secret doctrine in grad school, he reveals only to his closest students. This is again Plato subtly plugging, subtly plugging, that after several dialogues of not answering everything, he may further investigate and have further answers for you. Many have suggested Plato does seem to be upselling his whole and we're going to keep going and we're going to get some stuff here. We'll get to Aristotle. Aristotle's like, I'm going to go do my own thing eventually because I can't be your successor at the place. And he goes off with his own peripatetics and they walk off somewhat into the sunset elsewhere. So Socrates suggests that the philosophers who uh, suggest did in the Republic, that the philosophers who lead society uh, lie to the lower classes in a similar way, but anyone who has read the Protagoras' text Truth at the time would know that Protagoras opens with the statement, man is the measure of all things, and does not mean to be obs obscure or cryptic about it at all. He's very upfront with it. Socrates says Protagoras possibly kept the idea that things can't simply be large and not small, or heavy and not light, or simply be any particular thing, because all things are in a process of becoming. This is Heraclitus, and down in the shadows and possibly with the fire, of being and not being. And this is what all the ancient great, philo uh, great philosophers, except, he says, Parmenides, say, including, so this is Plato making a list. He's taking his names and checking them twice. He says, Parmenides is the one exception who does not believe in relativism. Does not believe, eh, we're just the measure of all things. Zebras are zebras to us. Now, that's odd. Because honestly, I can't really agree with that statement. But, given these class lectures, no, he doesn't. But Plato says, this is Plato telling us and his audience, Parmenides alone is not like Heraclitus. This includes Protagoras, Heraclitus, and Empedocles. He says all these guys are relativists, categorically, but Parmenides is the only one who's not. Technically, Parmenides is some guy who says change and motion are impossible. Even the poemer, poet Homer, whom Socrates calls the captain of the team, 
said that the ocean was the father of all things. So he's saying Homer, whom Heraclitus, I think I hope I am whoming my whoms correctly, said, I know it's Heraclitus, says he should be cudgeled for lying about the gods. He says, no, Homer was a relativist like all the rest of these jerks, unlike Parmenides, who says this is technically not happening right in front of your face. So again, yeah, that's a very weird way to, ro you know, that's a very strange roster uh, to say is the team of relativism everyone except Parmenides. If Team Homer Heraclitus is right, then all things are made of fire in flux, and this means that knowledge, too, would have to be in motion, just as all things are stirred in circles by the golden rope of the sun's cycle. Socrates asks Theotetus, who could take on such a team with such a captain? Well, we need to be the good guys, is what he means. Team relativism is evil, and he's like, you and I, kid are going to go up against him, which is odd if what I was telling you earlier in lectures is true, and Socrates actually was very much like Heraclitus, because now Plato is having Socrates uh, lead a boy in a questionable situation into basically siding with, I guess, Pythagoras, although he says nobody except Parmenides, and then we kind of don't hear so much right here about Pythagoras, which is odd. So what is going on? Socrates presents Theotetus with many dizzling, pu dizzying puzzles of relativism that many critics do not think present much of a clear point before finally asking him to look around to make sure none of the uninitiated can hear them. So again, we have another play here on we're not going to tell everybody everything even as I'm telling you something which we're not going to tell everybody. Those who think that only visible things are real. Socrates is doing what he suggests Protagoras was doing, withholding knowledge again. And he says perhaps he did that. That would have been cool. Those who do not believe in invisible things are crude, but Team Homer is refined, and Socrates will initiate Theotetus into their secrets, mocking them sarcastically for being crude, but also obscure in teaching people that only moving things are real, and anyone who says otherwise is incorrect. Theotetus is not sure if any of this makes sense in spite of his initiation, and he doesn't know if Socrates believes it or is simply testing him. Lots of plays within plays. Socrates says that he is helping Theotetus to come to his own idea of it. And Theotetus says Socrates does present the idea as quite reasonable. It is unstated, but obvious that Socrates is playing the best devil's advocate for his opponent's position and does not include himself with Team Homer, but rather excludes himself, like Parmenides, from it, of course. Socrates says they can doubt whether or not their conversation is merely a dream or a delusion. Here you have Life is But a Dream, which is a thought of Shakespeare and in India, China, the Taoists, a whole lot of people said, well, we can dream. How do we know this isn't a dream? Subjectivity, objectivity. Where's the objectivity if this is a dream in my head? People have known that for thousands of years and then thought lots of things about dreams as the Greeks did. And again, where's in your head was another related question, which people would ask. Because the dream's sort of in the guy's head when they wake up and say, hey, why'd you steal my spoons? It's like, I did not. That was in your head. I think is a convenient way of saying it, and even that doesn't talk about neurons in the slightest. Lots of plays in ancient times on that. So they have no test to prove things one way or the other, as the test would be part of the dream of the delusion, of course. And if you dream that you are flying, you truly have the experience you have, which is true. However, if we taste wine as sweet when we are healthy and sour when we are sick, which skeptics would point out is relativism, does this mean that you are a different person when you are sick? Buddha might say slightly so, yes, you're that person whenever, no matter how different you are. Protagoras would have to say that we have, have, been, we have been infinite people, ever changing, and that no one ever has the right to tell anyone they are wrong about anything, as there are no standards against which to measure right judgment if everything is real to the one who perceives it. Technically, again, that's right if the relativist says, yes, no one's absolutely right about anything, but you're relatively right more or less about things. Socrates concludes that Theotetus' idea that perception is knowledge is the same as tribe Heraclitus' idea that things are in motion and we are their measure. This is the idea of Theotetus that Socrates has helped him to carry to term. Again, I told you he was wrong, and Socrates says, I'm a midwife who dashes babies dashing our hopes, you know, when they're, when I'm, when I feel like being the jerk to the bad baby. And so he just threw out the baby with the bathwater entirely, which means that phase in phase two, Socrates will now test Theotetus' idea. It's a boy did volunteer, but not develop it much at all. Testing it, Socrates finds the idea is a mere phantom, not a real child, unlike the wonder boy Theotetus. But thankfully he does not dash against the doorframe. Socrates says they should carry their child around the fireplace as it is traditionally done 
to examine it from every angle. Here you actually have, this is a wonderful metaphor to pause on, uh, not stop on. We only have a tiny bit more material here. But like the blind men and the elephant of the Jains of India and then India and British and French poets and others, carry the child, uh, carry the idea of the child around the fireplace to examine it from every angle would be something like examining many parts of the elephant to see angles. Socrates says that philosophers who seem clumsy and stupid to most people are concerned with real eternal higher things such as beauty and knowledge, not the scandals in the next house over, which is why they often can't feed themselves or make their own beds. Aristotle says oh, we should uh, philosophers should just have everything done for them. They have to sit there and concentrate and apparently while walking around and sipping the lemonades they're handed. Perhaps Plato is thinking of the absent-minded Thales, who Aristotle comments on. And Theodorus did say that many great minds, unlike Theotetus, are not even keeled. Later, Aristotle will say, yeah, they should be made in the shade. Socrates says, when we hear the sounds of a foreign language, but we do not understand them, and foreigners do, so foreigners hear the sounds and know what they mean, but we hear the sounds and don't, it is the same with written languages as well, and this shows us that perception and knowledge are very much two different things. That is a very good example. If you hear Spanish and you don't understand it, or Japanese, or Greek, or if you, uh, what is the other example here? And that's, that yes, that that is, and that you see writing in the foreign language and can't read it, but are literate. This also assumes that you're somewhat, lit well, if you're illiterate, all languages you cannot read, but if you are literate, you cannot read languages you're not literate in. That this shows that uh, knowledge is not merely acquisition of the form because you're staring right at it. That is a very good example. I do mention here, as Wittgenstein does say, funny enough, you can't point a gun at somebody. He doesn't say point a gun, but you can't point a gun at somebody and make them understand Greek. Uh, but you could make them go off somewhere in a terrible place and learn Greek for several years and then point a gun at them and make them come back. Um, so you can't actually point a gun at somebody and force them to understand ancient Greek because they're not trained and gone through the motions. That's actually true. That leaves open how you go through the motions and whether or not it's recollection, doesn't it? So this would also have been a wonderful example for Socrates, who says he has no ideas, of, while having many of them, to have mentioned before telling Theotetus that he's stuck with the earliest idea they both had together. So Theotetus says they could argue that perceiving uh, that after having classes in language and perceiving a lot of things, we would perceive them differently. So Socrates turns to memory, and he says, if we still know things when we no longer perceive them. Theotetus has to agree that we do know things that we are not seeing with our eyes or remembering with our mind, or he commits himself that when we shut our eyes, we've lost track of absolutely everything and we know nothing at all. Unfortunately, this means he can't say that remembering things is reperceiving them, um, which means that we are doing something other than perception and knowing things, of course. These are all good examples. I do like Wittgenstein, and I think he weaves them uh, things like this, not these, in interesting ways that are a bit better than this. But so far now, Plato is giving very good examples of why you cannot just say a form is understanding. Whatever that says about wisdom. But it is the immaterial to the material. It is certainly that. Um, Socrates says, Protagoras cannot defend himself as wise or his relativism as correct as he would have to admit on the stand, where Socrates soon will be, that any imbecile is just as correct in their judgments as he is. The Taoists would say, well, every imbecile is smarter than you in some way, but that's not what Socrates means. He means about everything. Protagoras is an ignorant pig and can't prove himself otherwise a man. Uh, Socrates said, uh, ouch. Ends his whole career. Protagoras is also possibly the first to call himself a sophist, wisdomist, and Plato is definitely the, uh, if not the person, one of the, if not the, guy who gets, along with Aristotle, a student, us to say sophistry is bad, philosophy is good. That's because possibly Plato called his stuff wisdom talk love, like Socrates, and not sophistry. Otherwise, things might be slightly different. So Plato basically says the sophists are immoral philosophers who you just pay and they're like a high-priced lawyer. They'll tell you anything. And he's already critiqued Gorgias for Mino. Protagoras taught rhetoric for a price and Plato presents Socrates as the one who can first argue for and then argue against Protagoras, just as Parmenides told him to do for years to train in thought and debate. Socrates argues further, uh, fitting with fees and tutoring the rich in rhetoric, the Protagoras has no position against might makes right. 
which is the Republic, one to two, that truth is nothing but power over others, enforcing your will on others, if man is the measure of all things. This returns again, yes, to the Republic, what he was attacking entirely throughout that famous work, and then sums it up with the Timaeus cosmology, which is his central... Again, altogether, is very much Plato putting forward his views. Theodorus brings up Heraclitus, now that Protagoras has been soundly defeated, and says that followers violently uh, passionate, uh, that his followers are violently passionate, and you may as well try to debate with a maniac. They are always in motion. Uh, skeptics and relativists are not steady people, and so they can't be pinned down, and if you ask them a question, they fire several arrows swiftly, one after the other from their quiver of quotations and sayings. That's what I do. Leading from one meaning to another. Socrates does too, though. And from one metaphor to another. You can never get anywhere with them because they refuse to stand still. I pace around my apartment all the time. Ask the cats. Well, you won't get a word out of them. You know about that. Socrates brings up Parmenides. Says Parmenides is in opposition, again to the Homer Heraclitus traveling circus. A circle of fire in the sky with Johnny Cash. But when you try to talk to Parmenides, which Socrates reminds us he did as a boy in the last dialogue... And it is similarly impossible to talk to him about knowledge, as the one is indivisible and immobile, and so nothing else can be said. Between these two lines of warriors facing off, they are being pulled in opposite directions, he says. Theodetus says he has heard that an account with judgment is knowledge, and that things can be accounted for, unlike those that are un unknowable, and indeed knowable. Socrates says that giving an account of something is to make our thoughts vocal with words and expressions, and that vocalizing judgments depends on referencing the primary elements of the subject. We can go through a wagon part by part, pri primary element by primary element. Plato's chariot is similar to Buddha's chariot in the questions of uh, King King Melissus? King Me Mali Dang it. Skimming, uh, blanket on the name. I think it is something like Melinda. No, it's not Melissa. Melinda. King Melinda. Yay. Doing the Greek stuff. Got to shift modes a bit. Just as, so you cannot say a wagon is each of its pieces just. Just as we write words letter by letter, they're not the word unless they're all together as the word. The way to the whole is through the parts, as if there is a set number of things to know, such as the forms, and an order through which to know them. Third and lastly, we can say in an account of things how each is different from each other thing, such as the sun, the brightest thing there is. Thus, while the eternal forms and their differences are left for future discussions, we have a route of sameness and difference laid out for them. And Neoplatonism for hundreds and thousands of years, which is it's a human system of thought, what wouldn't, understand things very specifically in terms of sameness and difference, and states that quite blatantly here. Socrates concludes with Theotetus, they have both failed to produce a complete understanding of perception and its relationship to knowledge. It goes unmentioned that this is because the eternal, ideal forms have yet to be presented, leaving things in a state of confusion. And that said, Socrates goes through a couple other quick subjects and then says, and then I've got to go to some sort of trial, and then that's the last of it. So that is what we know very much of Plato, or at least what we're going to cover in the mortal sphere of this semester. So much happiness. I'm going to follow with some on Aristotle, the skeptics, uh, Epicurus, and the Stoics. And then we also have a lot on Buddhism and other subjects to cover this semester. So much happiness, and I will see you if I ever see you.